This reading will serve as the basis for today's sermon message. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of of all that that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life, and I will raise Him up on the last day. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Gotta get that bread. Those are four words I started using in college. They're slang words, so like most slang words that I use, I had no idea what they meant. I still, until about 48 hours ago, had no idea what they meant. Uh, I checked to make sure with my friends they weren't something inappropriate, and then I just started using them when they felt right. Uh, So I would go to football practice and say something like, gotta get that bread, or I'd go to work and say, gotta get that bread, or I'd be laying in bed and not want to get out to do the workout that I knew I had to do. And I tell myself, got to get that bread. Why? I'm not sure. But I did the research, and like anybody loves a good Google search, I found the etymology of this slang phrase, got to get that bread. And it is a synonym for get that money, which makes sense to me. But like most of these slang terms, the use is actually a lot broader. So it could be get that money, get that success, uh, probably traces back to people calling money dough. Now, none of this really matters all that much, except I wonder with how broad that term is, gotta get that bread. What is the bread that we're chasing after? Because in the reading for today, there were big crowds who were there to get that bread. So if you open up your Bibles, you can follow along in this. We're kind of going to go through a lot of John chapter 6. At the beginning of John chapter 6, what Jesus does is feed the 5,000. Jesus gives the bread, right? There's 5,000 men. There's all of these women and children. There is a huge crowd of people gathered around Jesus, and they're, they're hearing his word. They want to hear his teaching, and they're so committed to hearing his teaching that Jesus and the disciples are afraid to send them home because they'll pass out on the way because they're so famished. And so what does Jesus do? He decides to host a meal. He decides to bring the bread. The only problem is that Jesus doesn't have any. The disciples don't have any food, and so they go out and they find this one little boy who has five loaves of bread and two fish. If you know the story, you're nodding along. And and Jesus blesses them and starts pulling bread and fish out of the basket, and he just keeps pulling it out of the basket until everybody is satisfied, 12 baskets left over. Shortly after this, the crowd loses Jesus. They don't know where he is. And then they find him again. And in the passages right before this one, it says that they're looking for him because they have never seen anything like this. Jesus gives that bread to multitudes. They've never seen anything like this. They've never even heard of anything like this except for that passage that Vicar read to us of the Old Testament reading when God gave them manna in the wilderness They knew there was something special about this Jesus. But as they come to him, Jesus actually tells them that they're not just looking 
for the Savior. They're not just looking for the signs. He says, you guys are looking for bread. They came to Jesus because they've got to get that bread. And what does Jesus tell them? He tells them not to work for the bread that perishes, but for the food that doesn't perish. And they're on board with this because they are hungry. They have this appetite and it needs to be satisfied. And so they listen to Jesus and they say, okay, we should be pursuing the bread that doesn't perish. So just tell us how to do that. Tell us what we need to do and we'll figure it out. Just give us the simple steps and we will go and get that bread. And I think that sometimes maybe we can relate to that. Sometimes, like the Israelites, sometimes we can be focused on our own appetite. And like the Israelites, we like to work for what comes to us. We like to be the ones who earn what we need to survive. We like to have control. And I don't know what the bread is for you. Maybe the bread is money. Maybe it's just you need to get enough to put the roof over your head, to put the food on the table for your family. Or maybe the bread is money and you have a certain goal, a certain lifestyle that you hope to maintain and it feels like the more money you get, the farther that lifestyle seems to be away from you. Or maybe the bread's success. Maybe it's the reputation you have at work or with your friends. Maybe, maybe the bread is belonging. Maybe the bread is being significant. Maybe the bread is feeling needed. And I think when you look at the busyness of most of our schedules, it, it feels like a lot of times we fill our schedules so full of stuff so that we feel like we have this kind of significance, like we can justify ourselves to the people around us. When we talk about how busy we are, they know we must be really important people because we're always doing something all the time. Got to get that bread. And yet the bread that we're chasing, when we're chasing the bread that we can work for, is like that wonder bread. And if you, ever, if you ever got hungry and you had some wonder bread in the cabinet, you can just like pull it out, pull out a slice and ball it up into a little tiny ball, pop it in your mouth and it basically dissolves because it's practically just sugar. And it might satisfy your hunger for a minute. But man does not live on bread alone. And I can tell you, man cannot survive on wonder bread alone. There is no sustenance in it. Jesus is calling us deeper. He's calling us to chase a deeper kind of bread. Jesus answered them, this is, this is the work of God. That you believe in him who he sent. The work of God is to believe in Jesus. You see, Jesus is the bread that satisfies. He's calling them to a deeper kind of bread. And that gets us up to our text for today. Jesus had called them out for looking for bread, and now the, the people are going to tell them exactly, tell Jesus exactly why it is that they're looking for bread. You see, they're not just looking to satisfy their appetites. That's a big part of it. They want to satisfy their appetites. They want to do the work. But even now that they know that Jesus is claiming to be the guy that God sent, they recognize, okay, the bread that we want to get might not be something we have to work for. But you have to prove that you can provide. You see, if you're going to call me to trust, I'm going to need to see something from you. And so the Israelites have this in their mind. They have this kind of national identity. The national identity goes back to the Old Testament book of Exodus, that this is where they really, they find most of their identity in the Passover and the events that followed as God brought them to the promised land because they were enslaved people. They were oppressed 
people, and they felt oppressed here and now. But they knew that their God was a God who delivered them. And so when they looked back, they saw that when they were in slavery in Egypt, God gave them a leader. He gave them Moses. As they looked back, God rescued them from the wicked tyrant who was Pharaoh. God brought them out of the land. He even gave them his presence so that they could see that God was with them with with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And as as they're quoting this scripture, they're actually quoting another person who's just recounting the national narrative. This is from Nehemiah chapter 9, if you want to look that up later. As Yeshua the high priest is giving this sermon on what the people of Israel have been through. And for him, the manna is the proof that God is with them. God provides for them. And out in the wilderness, what you just heard was that God gives them the bread. He filled their appetites and he showed them that he was there caring for them. And this crowd thinks that Jesus is pretty cool. Feeding 5,000 people, that's pretty cool. Having bread from heaven, that's pretty cool stuff. But is he going to do it again? Because the manna was there six days a week and on the sixth day there was enough for the seventh day. God gave that bread every single day of the week to fill their stomachs. Is Jesus, is Jesus really going to do that? And what I think we miss sometimes in this English translation, and it's a good translation because it shows us that when Jesus is responding, he's saying, he's talking about himself, right? The bread is he who comes down from heaven. But in the Greek, this is actually an ambiguous term. And so if you were to pull this verse completely out of its context and you didn't have the context after it telling you that this is talking about Jesus, it could be saying the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven or the bread of God is the stuff that comes down from heaven. And that second reading is probably what the hearers heard. So when they respond, sir, give us this bread always, They still don't get it because they think that Jesus is going to prove that he is the guy, that he is something special, that he is the new Moses by filling their stomachs. They're still thinking about their appetites. They're still thinking about how God is going to fit Jesus into their story, how God is going to come and and fulfill their national identity, how God is going to come and fulfill the very things that they have hoped for. And I think we're guilty of saying the same thing. We have a national identity too. And as we look back on it, it, this is not going to be the whole story because only, only God really knows the whole story. But in this nation, we felt oppressed. We felt like we couldn't put bread on the tables for our families. And so we pushed back. We, we earned our way out from under the oppression of England, even though that oppression wasn't slavery but taxation. We earned freedom. We worked for freedom. And that freedom was once to provide food for our families, but now, well, somewhere along the line, it seems like freedom was the freedom to satisfy our own appetites. Whatever that appetite might be, the freedom to satisfy the appetite of of getting as much money as I can, the freedom to satisfy the appetite of of whatever drives my stomach, the freedom to satisfy whatever sexual appetite I have, or maybe for most of us, I think think the longings we have are deeper. The things we expect Jesus to fulfill are deeper. Deeper. We want to pursue our freedom for community. We want to pursue our freedom to belong. We want to pursue our freedom for significance so that people look at us and recognize how important I am. These are the things we hunger for. And when we think that we've got to get that bread, we think that Jesus is the one who's going to fulfill that. 
right? We, we have this story that we're living out our lives. We're pursuing what we want, but Jesus is kind of the cap on it to make sure that we get what we need. And yet Jesus isn't actually interested in building our kingdom. He's interested in building his own. I heard a story of a man who, uh, he had a, a mentor. He was starting his own business, as, and this mentor was somebody that he looked to to help him build this business successfully. Now, this mentor was a man who faithfully attended church and, and who saw that as the most important thing he did. So one of the pieces of advice he gave to this man was, if you're going to be successful, you're going to want to spend time in a church. If you're going to be successful, you're going to want to give 10%. And so this man started going to church. He started tithing 10%. And he said, I was doing all of it because I wanted Jesus to make me rich. And that's when he learned the lesson that Jesus wasn't there to build his kingdom. He was there to build God's kingdom. And that's exactly what he did. He pulled him into God's kingdom as he realized that Jesus was way better than all of the riches in the world. When Jesus says, I am the bread, he changes the world. Because Jesus is the bread that satisfies. He's not the bread that you can work for. He's not the bread that you can earn. All we can do is come to him and have faith in him. But Jesus is the bread that satisfies. And he satisfies more than just what we think we need. He satisfies more than just the desires that I think that I have. But he satisfies those and so much more. To the hungry, Jesus feeds them. To, to those hungering for a place to belong. He gives them a place to belong in himself. And even if you don't feel like you belong in the church, you belong with Jesus and the church will figure it out eventually. If we feel like we need significance, if we feel like we need to matter, Jesus raises us up on the last day and gives us eternal life. Nothing matters as much as something that is going to be here for eternity. Jesus satisfies your desires. He satisfies your appetite, but he does even more than that. He calls you into a purpose too. He drives you forward to go into this world and share the story of how Jesus has made your story not about you anymore, but how Jesus has worked in your story to bring you into God's kingdom, to bring you to something that is so much bigger than yourself. Jesus is the bread that satisfies. When I think back to all of the times that God has continued to teach this lesson to me over and over again, I remember when I was in high school, sports were pretty much my entire life. And I would play basketball always through the season of Advent and usually a little bit into the season of Lent. And my parents let that be my decision on what I was going to do during those midweek services. Now, this was the time before you couldn't pull up online and watch the service. Uh, and for me, I decided that I would be where I was needed more. Now, I didn't think that the people in the pews needed me. But it seemed like my teammates needed me a lot. And I recognize now as I look back that was really, really short-sighted and it didn't even take into account what I needed at all. But if I were to go back to Cleveland, Ohio, where I grew up, I don't think any of those kids that I played basketball with would be there to contact me. I'd have at least 10 people from the church that were, though. And even though at that point most of the church didn't know I was going to be a pastor, I realized looking back that my presence, just being there in the sanctuary was proof to people that their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren, that the gospel was going to survive. I recognize now looking back that there were people who prayed for me. There were people who cared for me. There were people who needed me there. But even more than that, God was unfolding bigger gifts. 
Eventually, by the end of the season, my sophomore year, I decided that being in worship was more important. And every time I showed up, God reminded me that Jesus is the bread that satisfies. He reminded me of how he's satisfying. He reminded me of how he's going to raise me up on the last day. He reminded me that whether I felt needed or not, he was filling my life with an eternal significance. All because Jesus, Jesus is the bread that satisfies. He's the bread that fulfills the will of his Father. He is the bread that holds on to you and holds you here in the kingdom. And this all, all of this, is the power of the cross. That last week we talked about being born again, the gift that Jesus delivers through the cross in baptism. And this week, we talk about Jesus the bread, who has given you this new life, who has borne you into his kingdom, and now he sustains you by giving his very self on the cross. It's just like Paul said, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus is here. He is here to satisfy. He is here, so come to Jesus. Even if it's the first time you're coming or if you've come a hundred times before, come to Jesus. Even if you're crossing your arms to receive a blessing, come and receive this blessing. Come into the presence of our Lord, because here is the bread that satisfies. Jesus satisfies. And then go and share the story of how Jesus has changed your story completely. Because you know that you will not satisfy by chasing after the wonder bread of this world, but Jesus is the bread that sustains us. So come get this bread. And now may the peace which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. This time we have a weekly awakening question. If you have your phone, feel free to take it out, snap a picture of this, or write it down. Identify how Jesus satisfies you and share it. Talk about that with your families this week. Identify how Jesus satisfies you and share it.